shocked at the news about the Viking raid on Lindisfarne, Alcuin, an Anglo-Saxon scholar at Charlemagne's court, stated that such disasters are a warning to local communities in Northumbria to become better Christians. The Vikings were a heathen force occupying Denmark and the surrounding coastline of Sweden and Norway, who were determined to defend their culture, which they felt was under threat from Charlemagne's armies, who were already winning battles on the continent and expanding the Frankish Empire. Instead of confronting Charlemagne, they gave a show of force by attacking Holy Island in Northumberland because it was a soft target. The raid on Lindisfarne in AD 793 is acknowledged as marking the beginning of the Viking Age in the West. However, a few years earlier in AD 787, three ships landed in Portland, Dorset. The local sheriff greeted his visitors, which was returned by hacking him to death. The Vikings storm into history on 8th of June, AD 793, when the serene and calm lives of the monks at Lindisfarne was brutally shattered. On a clear day, a Viking longboat would have been seen 18 nautical miles away and given a fair wind, made landfall within an hour. But the monks would have no warning of these horrors appearing over the horizon. Such a voyage was not thought possible, and certainly such an atrocity had never been seen in Britain. Instead of coming for trade, their Danish visitors took a more direct approach by plundering and slaughtering to the extent that the Church of St Cuthbert was splattered with the blood of its priests. Further raids down the east coast of England followed, including an attack on London by sailing up the Thames, and then Canterbury, where, in 851, instead of returning home, the army spent the winter months at Thanet in Kent, establishing a permanent encampment overlooking Pegwell Bay, where, today, a replica Viking longboat at Cliff's End is a reminder of their visit. Raids of this kind are how the Vikings are remembered, and not always as best, which in today's parlance could be described as having a bad press. They arrived a couple of centuries after the Romans departed, in an era known as the Dark Ages, and there were many raids, but in 895 an entire Danish army sailed up the River Trent from the Humber to the strategic town of Repton in the heart of England, not only to plunder, but to settle. Soon the Viking tide caused the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Mercia, Northumbria and East Anglia to fall one by one, with only Alfred the Great's Wessex holding out. After winning the Battle of Eddington in Wiltshire, Alfred took the brave step to make a pact with Guthrum, the Viking king, by converting him to Christianity, the very thing he was fighting against. Eventually, they retreated to the eastern side of England, establishing their own Danelaw and marrying into the community. Matters were not always peaceful and large-scale violence returned in the 990s, when peace could be purchased with protection money known as Danegold. Exiled, the English king Ethelred the Unready tried to regain control of land currently under Danish rule, with the help of Olaf, the Norwegian king who was only too willing to offer assistance. London Bridge between Southwark 
and where the Tower of London now stands, was strategic in Olaf winning the battle. Ingeniously won by sailing up the Thames, their boats, protected from stones being hurled by Danish forces on the bridge, they secured cables on its pillars, pulling it down, hastening the storming of Southwark, with London retaken. It is believed that the rhyme, London Bridge is Falling Down, originates from this episode. Back in Norway, Olaf's premature death in battle brought about miraculous happenings, and he was declared a saint. Several churches in London honour him with a dedication to Olaf, and of those standing, St Olaf's Hart Street, close to Fenchurch Street Station, is the most notable, its churchyard gateway known as Ghastly Grim Gate nicknamed much later by Charles Dickens as Saint Ghastly Grimm. Atrocities continued and in 1012 the Archbishop of Canterbury was captured and when the ransom was not forthcoming he was brutally murdered with stones, blocks of wood and an axe. By 1028 England was once more under Danish rule with King Canute on the throne, ruling a kingdom that included the whole of England, Denmark and Norway, which lasted less than 30 years, until the great drama of the Norman conquest of 1066. Unlike the Normans and the Romans before them, the Vikings left very little as testimony of their stay. Indeed, they were more intent on destroying than building a legacy. There are exceptions, such as the buried hordes that laid undiscovered for over a thousand years, and a rare example of a Viking cross at Gosforth Church, in the shadow of England's highest mountain, Scorful Pike. The Vikings left their mark in place names that still echo today. Towns such as Whitby and Derby that end in by are Viking in origin, as is Thorpe in Scunthorpe and Cleethorpes. Villages ending in Thwaite are from the Old Norse, meaning a woodland clearing, such as Bassenthwaite in the Lake District. But the most well known Scandinavian influences are Fell for a hill, Beck for stream, and Foss after Foss for a waterfall, all in common usage in the north of England. Today we can only imagine what life under the Vikings was like. The Jorvik Viking Centre in the city of York recreates how life would have been after it was captured in AD 866. It is established on the site of excavations carried out in Coppergate between 1976 and 1981. But very little of noticeable evidence of the Viking occupation is to be seen on the surface, if at all. The Viking settlements would have been very squalid, living cheek by jowl in flea-ridden squalor, of which the sights and smells can be experienced in the Jorvik Viking Centre. Unique on the west coast of Cumbria, between Sellafield and the Lake District, is St Mary's Church Gosforth, a Grade 1 listed building with rare Viking Age carved stones. Prominent in the churchyard is the Gosforth Cross, a sandstone structure standing nearly 15 feet high, the tallest in the country and dating from the early part of the 10th century. It is elaborately carved with a mixture of pagan and Christian themes. On display inside the church are two hogback stones, very rare examples of pre-Norman tomb markers, discovered under the foundations of a 12th century wall around 1896. Exposed to the North Sea in Yorkshire is Whitby. 
which has been a settlement since Roman times. But the name is Danish, its harbour founded by settlers in the 10th century. The original minster was abandoned after the Viking raids at the end of the 9th century, but the Benedictine monastery that dominates the headland today was founded in the 11th century after the Norman conquest, with much of the existing fabric dating from the 13th century. It suffered under the suppression in 1539, eventually reduced to a shell that has become a major tourist attraction since Victorian times, helped by Bram Stoker's Dracula and a modern-day revival of Gothic culture. Mention the Vikings and images of ruthless warriors crossing the North Sea in a convoy of longboats from Scandinavia with Lindisfarne firmly in their sights come to mind. The first monastery was founded in AD 635, but the ruins we see today are 12th century, therefore built after the raids. It was founded by St. Aidan, who came from Iona, and it became the home and eventually the resting place for Cuthbert, the most famous of its monk bishops. During the raids, the monks fled to the mainland, taking St. Cuthbert's relics with them, now enshrined at Durham Cathedral. Today's building is a shell, but it is to the memory of St. Cuthbert that pilgrims come, soaking up the atmosphere of an island that can only be reached by a tidal causeway. Move away from the coach parties and crowds that gather in the vicinity of the village and gift shops, and the real sanctuary of Holy Island is experienced, a far remove from today's turbulent world and the island's Viking past. <laughs>